So on New Year's Eve, I watched a movie that was so uniquely horrible that I tweeted I was tempted to make a top 10 worst movies of 2014 episode just so I could put this movie at number one. But then so many of you tweeted back I should totally do it. And so, welcome to that episode. But before we rag on 10 movies, let's put out some good karma. And I want to highlight four films from 2014 that I feel were criminally overlooked. The first is Draft Day, starring Kevin Costner and directed by Ivan Reitman. This is a fantastic look at professional football from a very unique angle, the business side. And if you're a fan of Beyond the Trailer and episodes like Movie Math, where I go over the box office every week, I think you'll really enjoy this look at the professional football league and how teams are put together. And also, different kinds of careers that you can pursue if you want to be a part of the football uh, industry, but you don't play football. So it's a very very, very uh, good film, and I highly recommend it. Uh, the next, in, in a similar vein, is Canton Floss. This is a little bit by the numbers film, but I think it has enough interesting and unique aspects to make it worth your time. And it does a wonderful job of showcasing uh, a Mexican talent uh, back in the you know the glory days of film. There are so many great movies that have been made about you know the 1940s and 50s etc in Hollywood and here is the rise of uh, a Mexican comedic star uh, incredibly well known uh, in Spanish speaking countries but not so much elsewhere uh, and this is Mario Moreno uh, aka Canton Floss and I think the film is really well done it is as I said again by the numbers but still it is a really well done by the numbers Hollywood behind the scenes film. And also Oscar Yaneda, who plays Canton Floss, does such a fantastic job of not only um, portraying Canton Floss, the character, but showing the evolution of Mario Moreno from, you know, someone who just falls into showbiz uh, to someone who becomes, you know, a very, very uh, strong businessman who really knows what he's doing. So to see the evolution of a of a, profesh, a professional, I guess you could say, is also really fascinating to watch. Then I also have to say Chef. Chef got a lot of attention over the summer. It was a strong contender, but never incredibly strong. It ended up, I think, still only making just about $30 million at the box office. But I think that John Favreau's film about artistic integrity and doing what you want for a living, even if it's uh, a big risk, is I think another really nice gem from 2014 that people should make sure they they see and you know I think Boyhood is the smaller film you know the low budget you know a little bit of a, you know not not too artistic but you know it, it's like a deceptively artistic I guess you could say and that really has gotten all the attention during award season and perhaps if Boyhood didn't exist Chef would get a little bit more recognition but Boyhood does exist and it's kind of squeezed Chef out uh, then finally I have to say Give Legends of Oz Dorothy's Return a shot. It's a very good, solid animated film, so, sort of like uh, the old school ones, like All Dogs Go to Heaven or The Secret of Nim. You know, it's not the level, of course, of the big leagues like uh, Pixar, Disney, uh, Illumination Entertainment, DreamWorks, but you know, it's still a good animated movie, and I think it's the kind that would really stick with you for younger viewers in particular. It's just dark enough to really make an impression. And so I think that for some reason it got kind of like squeezed out by uh, animation fans who, I don't know why, you know, we discussed this on Morning Movie News. I have no idea why people were so angry with this movie and really fought against it. But it didn't deserve to be, uh, you know, uh, shut out like that. And I really wish that more people would give it a chance. I'm not saying it's as good as the best animated movies out there, but it's a really solid film and one that I think you'd particularly enjoy like on a a rainy afternoon or now that we're in uh, January a cold a cold and snowy afternoon so I would definitely uh, at least try it all right so now on to my top 10 worst movies of 2014 we're gonna work our way down to number one and as usual on these longer episodes there are annotations here to help you skip around if you choose to do so all right so what is my 10th worst film of 2014 uh, I have my list here but that would have to be Tammy. Now the reason Tammy is the you know the the lowest on this list is because I think that we all knew that it was coming so it's not that big a surprise. I think Melissa McCarthy has been dancing on the edge of a bad movie for quite some time. I think she narrowly escaped it with Identity Thief and came even closer with the heat. I think Sandra Bullock did a lot to pull her away from just having a horrible film. And so did Jason Bateman but in Tammy 
I guess that's the problem. It was all Melissa McCarthy, and it was just, I guess Susan Sarandon was supposed to be there, but it was largely the Melissa McCarthy show, and she just really be, uh, fell back on every trick that she uh, has at this point, which she's used so much that I think they're already stale and obvious. Uh, and I just think, you know, Tammy really had no story, it had no character arc, it tried to, uh, but it, not a compelling one, and it just was really supposed to be pure, unfiltered Melissa McCarthy, and I think that it showed that Melissa McCarthy needs guidance. This was a film she made with her husband, and I think that uh, it's an, yet another example of how even the most talented performers really, you know, this is why Hollywood is a team business, because you need other people to point out when things aren't working. And this is going to be kind of a theme throughout our top ten, uh, you know, talent that was not reined in accordingly. So that's my number 10, worst movie of the year. Uh, number 9 is The Expendables 3. Uh, this film was boring and bloated and uh, unnecessary. And also, for some reason, this was the film I think where Sylvester Stallone had the younger generation uh, focused on the most. This is where he rounds up uh, a team of actors who are, uh, well, it's apparently very hard to get a current you know, younger actor to star in Expendables movie when you consider who he actually ends up with, like Kellen Lutz, and that's the biggest name on the team. Ronda Rousey, although she looks like she's doing a better job in the upcoming Entourage movie. But still, you had this team of just, you know, not only bad actors, but actors no one cares about taking up considerable screen time in a film, in a franchise that's supposed to focus on older actors. That's the whole point of it. Uh, and then also it had a ton of really bad one-liners. Uh, Antonio Banderas and Wesley Snipes were the only good things in this film. And Mel Gibson, it would be great to say, oh, he proved that he still got it, but it just, uh, he, his performance just lands with a thud. And Harrison Ford looks like, again, still half asleep. And instead of making, instead of this movie showing you, hey, you underestimated these actors, they still got it. Instead of having you walk away with that attitude, you would, uh, at least I left the theater being like, yeah, my, my judgment of those actors and their current state was correct. They don't have it, they lost it, and I don't have much of an interest in seeing them, uh, you know, anymore. And that's, that's very scary for those actors, which is, of course, why they make this move, this franchise. They participate. But I think Sylvester Stallone is really letting them down. Uh, he had someone else come in and direct this movie. Uh, the guy who got the Raid remake a gig. I don't know how. So, such a horrible job here. Um, I think Sylvester Stallone needs to really try and, you know, get out the checkbook. Uh, he's paying a lot of money. You know, he didn't want to pay $4 million to Bruce Willis, which is why uh, Harrison Ford took over in that role. But I think that Sylvester Stallone needs to divert more funds to talent behind the camera. And I think the people on camera, they've already made a ton of money in their heyday of their careers. They should be willing to take a pay cut as well to get better material. All right, so the uh, eighth, the eighth worst film of the year, in my opinion, was Dumb and Dumber 2. Uh, which is a shame because this trailer was played so many times that I actually was really looking forward to the film by the time it hit theaters and had won me over. Very good trailer. And that's one of the chief problems. I think Dumb and Dumber 2 was perhaps the worst offender of a movie for 2014, which had all the funny stuff in the trailer. Uh, but even worse than that, uh, I mean, it was also just plain dumb. It was really dumb. It had TV-level pr production values. But the worst thing about it, why it earned a spot on this list, were the twist endings. It had two. Now, the first twist ending seemed a little bit clever. I didn't see it coming, and I thought it might actually save the film. But then the final twist, I don't want to give it away in case anyone wants to actually watch this movie, but I wouldn't recommend it. But it just kind of made the entire movie pointless. It was one of those twists where you were like, well, then what did we just do for the last hour and a half? It made no sense. It was beyond dumb. It was, you know, not even uh, believable in the Dumb and Dumber universe. And it just kind of made you angry with the characters and that you, again, as I said, wasted your time. Just absolutely horrible movie. And I hate twist endings like that, which, you know, just make the audience feel foolish. I certainly did when I left the theater. All right, so the seventh worst film of the year, and some of you actually liked this movie, so we're going to, I'm sure, have a little bit of a friendly debate in the comments, but I'd have to put The Amazing Spider-Man 2 on this list. Uh, when I said I was going to make a top 10 uh, worst films of 2014, or I was considering it, a number of people actually said, you've got to put The Amazing Spider-Man 2 on there. It's one I wouldn't necessarily have thought of off the top of my head, but when it was recommended to me, I was like, you know what, it totally deserves a spot on this list. And as you can see, I put it at number six. Seven. And the reason I thought The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was so bad, I mean, I know a number of you enjoyed it, but I think that might be your Spider-Man 
uh, fandom speaking. And that's fine. I mean, Spider-Man has a wonderful fan base, and that's why it's such an important commodity to Sony, why they're not willing to totally give up on it. Uh, but they do realize they've obviously made some mistakes, as we know from their uh, the revealed behind-the-scenes uh, discussions they've been having with Marvel. Uh, but the reason it was so bad is I think almost single-handedly Jamie Foxx's Electra, which really was the level of a Batman and Robin villain. Something that we would hope that we'd left behind, but yet still lurks apparently in the edges of uh, comic book cinema. So that's a scary thing right there. Then also the script was very poor. Now, of course, Andrew Garfield and Mark Webb have said that the studio's uh, suits did a lot of meddling and chopped up what they thought was a really good film. But let's be honest. I mean, I can't, nothing can be chopped up just so horribly that even, like, the foundations of the character, uh, you know, are you know, that ruined. I mean, like, Electra would have been bad even if you gave him more screen time. I mean, if you gave him more character development. Just the choices that were made were incredibly poor. And speaking of poor choices, how do you mess up the death of Gwen Stacy? It is probably one of the most iconic stories in comic books. It's one of the most important deaths in comic books, right up there with the death of the Waynes. And here, it was just totally robbed of a lot of its uh, importance and emotional heft. I mean, some people were really affected by it, uh, but those are the people who managed to be surprised and not know that she was going to die going in. But I'll tell you how you mess it up. You make it that it's no longer Peter Parker's fault, which was the whole point of the death of Gwen Stacy, to underline that he was putting his loved ones in harm's way. But in an effort to not have that happen intentionally, so Sony and Mark Webb were worried about making Peter Parker quote unquote unlikable, they had Gwen Stacy literally, you know, Emma Stone reveal that they shot that scene where uh, Peter Parker's like, no, go home, leave the power plant. She's like, I have to stay. And they did that just to try and make Peter Parker more likable and to take away his culpability in her death. But Again, that's the whole point of the death, so it doesn't work. And also, they make Gwen Stacy kind of a Lois Lane character, and that's not the character of Gwen Stacy. That's Lois Lane. And I think that, um, you know, in an effort to, to say, to, you know, Hollywood meddling yet again, I guess you could say, that, you know, something that's worked for so long on the page, why would you feel you need to change it? Be, I mean, I'm like, it didn't make Peter Parker unlikable in the comics, right? He's probably the most likable guy in comics. <laughs> so why would you be concerned about that in the film? So just a whole lot of problems. And it's a shame because I thought Dane DeHaan's Harry Osborn was quite good. But maybe, maybe he'll get the chance to uh, shine in the upcoming Sinister Six movie if that ever truly does get made. They are, of course, in major meltdown mode over in the Sony uh, Spider-Man universe. All right, so that was number uh, one, uh, 10, 9, 8, seven. okay, that was number 7. Uh, number 6, speaking of Batman and Robin, would be Winter's Tale. From the screenwriter of Batman and Robin, Akiva Goldsman. Akiva Goldsman wrote this movie, he directed, directed this movie, he produced this movie. It is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. It is convoluted, it makes absolutely no sense. It's basically Akiva Goldsman's Downton Abbey. Uh, you know, with trying to have all these special, uh, you know, special effect ideas in it, uh, you know, fantasy elements, good versus bad, literally has uh, an angel and the devil fighting over the soul of Colin Farrell. Uh, but nothing seems to make sense. Storylines aren't carried through. Characters are introduced like I'd say two thirds through the film that are supposed to be a major character, uh, and then you're suddenly supposed to care about them. There's a time jump that really makes no sense to the story as a whole. Uh, it's based on a novel, which apparently people liked because it did well enough that Hollywood decided to make a movie out of it. But who knows if the novel just is uh, something that can't be adapted, or if Akiva Goldsman just, you know, simply strikes again. But a horrible, horrible film, uh, and a waste of time because it just literally makes no sense. Just really beyond stupid. Everything that you think is like the worst stereotype for a romance novel is in Winter's Tale. And they can't be that bad if they sell so many of them, right? I right? I'm assuming. I'm put I'm 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 giving the benefit of the doubt to romance novels. Alright, so that was number six. Number five is Exodus Gods and Kings. Now, this is interesting. I think on one hand it's a problem, as I said in my review, because of the whitewashing, which really is distracting. And this might go down in history as the film that was the beginning of the end of that practice in Hollywood, which would make it all worthwhile. The film has not done very well at the box office. Remember it cost, uh, well, I'm pointing out to you that it cost $140 million to make Exodus Gods and Kings, and so far worldwide it's just at 152. Now, when you factor in uh, the, the, the budget of 140 
category doesn't include advertising. And then, of course, the studio only gets half of the box office haul. So this is very much in the red. Also, it's not going to get a big chance to get into the black because it's been banned and will not be shown in a number of Middle Eastern countries because they find a number of elements with the film, including the whitewashing, but other religious elements as well, offensive. So I think that Hollywood's tampering with these classic stories from the Bible and just history might indeed, as I said, be coming to an end. And Exodus might be the beginning of that end. But also the reason Exodus is on here is that it just does not simply tell the story of Moses. That's the whole point of the movie. But it does a horrible job of telling the story of Moses. And then you might argue, well, you know, Ridley Scott wasn't interested in telling that story. He wanted to show a different version of it, a schizophrenic Moses, uh, you know, where natural disasters cause the, you know, the miracles of God that were, were attributed to God, like an earthquake, etc. But even that isn't well done. The movie simply does nothing, and there are long stretches of just complete boredom, and you really wonder what, what's the point of the movie. And this is particularly frustrating when you consider the talents involved, uh, especially behind the camera, and the beautiful sets and special effects that they did have at hand. I mean, the movie looks like it cost 140 but they just completely threw it away. All right, so number four, the fourth worst film of the year, in my opinion. I have to say, this might be another controversial choice, and this is Dear White People. Now, I know this is a film that a lot of people got behind, but I have to ask, did you get behind it before you saw it? And then maybe, you know, maybe you haven't even seen it still. I think that on paper, this film was a good idea, and I was excited about it. I thought the trailers were quite good. But when I actually saw the movie, I think it had a lot of problems, and I actually felt that it was, um, you know, negative and that it didn't do much to explore racism and I felt in some ways promoted it. It promoted, you know, segregation uh, and, and, you know, and I think made it seem like there was a problem somewhere that there isn't. Now, of course, it talks about a very real problem about these, uh, you know, racist parties that are being held at fraternities across the country. But I think the movie does such a bad job of showcasing that horrible phenomenon, it's very real as it makes clear in the credits, that it actually does not do its, its intended goal of shining a spotlight on that horrible act. And it makes it seem so unlikely and so ridiculous uh, that it, it, make, it actually, I think, works against the whole original goal of the film. I also put this film on here because I think that it's really poorly done from a creative standpoint. I think it reeks of being a student film, and I think the writing sounds like kind of like a college essay where someone wants to get into a college, uh, you know, um, you know, a quote unquote minority student, and they are like, well, I'll play up my minority factor to get into college. But they're, you know, it just again reeks of making up a problem, and you know, the character, the main character, is described as if Spike Lee and Oprah had a pissed off baby, and that's what the movies. Uh, personality is like as well. And instead of that just being a character, it's the movie itself which really, I think, rubs you the wrong way. Uh, and again, which is a shame. There are a lot of great movies made about race this year, uh, a lot of great movies starring uh, a black cast that weren't about race, which was also, I think, important. But you know, you're much better off watching a movie like Top Five than Dear White People, which really was just uh, a very clever, it was the call, it was the film version of a college essay. It got, got Justin Simeon a lot of attention, uh, but, you know, again, it's on the strength of the concept, uh, the concept was so strong, people overlooked the execution, which, again, incredibly poor. All right, so the third worst film of the year, in my opinion, is The Rover, which I know some of you enjoyed. In fact, some of you got quite upset with me when I really lay into the film in my initial review. But I stand by that review, and I feel The Rover is a prime example of the kind of pseudo-intellectualism that's come to grip Hollywood these days. And that's where filmmakers pose questions where they don't even have the answers to them. Now, there's always the debate as to whether or not answers need to be given in a film. And I, I am of the mind that they need to be, you know, at least uh, hinted at. Uh, but I think there are a lot of films being made these days, The Rover being one of them, where the filmmaker has no idea uh, what the answers are to the questions they're posing. They don't even really know where to start in terms of answering them. Now, of course, there are some questions that you can't really answer, or we're still figuring it out. But I think that you at least have to have an opinion as to what the answer is, or in what direction to go and while we search for that answer. So I think 
posing really complicated, ridiculous questions in the hopes of stumping the audience and saying, well, you know, I'm going to pretend I know the answer and then you're just going to go along with it uh, is, is just, uh, I think, actually offensive filmmaking. And it's something that is really caught on. I think Christopher Nolan is sometimes guilty of this and I think he might be the one who's really started this idea of, you know, self-important pseudo-intellectual filmmaking. Uh, and I do question as to whether or not he can explain the ending of Interstellar. And I liked Interstellar, uh, but still, uh, you know, again, it's you can't go and put things out there that you know you have don't even have the slightest idea of how to begin to answer. And the, the rover not only does that, but simply nothing happens in the movie. It's also self-important in that it dares you to watch it, in my opinion, because it's just like you know what I'm going to have just a movie where I have very little happen. I'm not really going to flesh out the world. I'm going to leave a lot of blank spaces, and I'm going to make it your job to fill in those blank spaces. And again, you know that's work that I'm not supposed to do as the audience. Uh, I think that putting all of that on the audience is selfish of the filmmaker and egotistical and again as I said uh, a prime example of pseudo-intellectualism and I'm sure I made a lot of people upset right now with my explanation of why I don't like the rover but I'm sorry that's how I feel about it and as you can see I feel quite strongly about it and I feel very strongly about the second worst film of the year which I feel is sabotage I really had serious problems with this movie because I felt it was just so revolting and that's a very strong word, I realize, but I really do feel it was that bad. The characters were despicable and un irredeemable. R just really the scum of the earth. Uh, and to see the way they were etched out in the film uh, and, asked, uh, and asked for us to follow them and potentially sympathize with them uh, was just really too much to ask, in my opinion. I felt that the film was just disgusting when I was over. I couldn't wait to get out of the theater. And you might realize or, or recognize that Fury had a similar problem with many of its characters. They were really also incredibly unlikable and despicable. Just horrible examples of humanity. Uh, and not in the interesting natural-born killer's way with Oliver Stone. And the reason I bring this up is that this is a film by David Ayer. And a lot of you defended him saying, well, you know, he didn't write that movie, uh, Sabotage, he just directed it. Well, you know, he also was behind Fury and had a similar problem. So apparently David Ayer thinks this is a cool way to make movies, to make truly unlikable, irredeemable characters. And I'm worried about that because he's, of course, directing Suicide Squad. And I think that while those have to be villainous characters, they're a team of villains after all, uh, I think that I worry that David Ayer will go too far and make them just absolutely horribly disgusting uh, characters that, you know, you, it's tough to watch, but yet not have the intellectual approach that Oliver Stone did with Natural Born Killers, which, you know, kind of, you know, Showed, showed it through a lens that made it okay to watch. You know, it was almost like a news article or something. It was an exploration of that kind of persona. So that was interesting in that hand. But David Ayer has yet to, uh, to add that intellectualism to the discussion. He just makes them, uh, just, it's like almost like, you know, like, I, I, and again, an immature filmmaker just being like, you know what, I, you know what's cool? Characters that people don't like. So I'm going to make a really unlikable character without any thought as to, you know, why that works, when it doesn't work, uh, you know, the idea of what makes a story interesting to an audience, how to engage them, just really uh, daring us to to look away. And if you look away, I guess David Ayer to some degree would go, I won, I made a comment about society. And I'd be like, no, you, you just made a really bad movie. Now, the worst movie of the year that inspired me to make this list, that would be The Gambler. I was shocked at how bad this film was. I went to see it uh, New Year's Eve during the day. Uh, you know, it was the only movie playing that I hadn't seen at this theater that I went to with some friends. And uh, I knew it was going to be bad, but I had no idea it would be so, as I said in my open, so uniquely horrible. It was truly a train wreck. It was so bad it was actually hard to look away because it was just inconceivable that someone of Mark Wahlberg's stature in Hollywood right now would put out a movie like this because he produced it as well. And I think that this is another example of, you know, an actor, as again, as I said with Melissa McCarthy at the beginning here at number 10, needing someone to say, this is bad. You can't do this. It's, it's really an embarrassment to you. And it might be an embarrassment to pull the plug on this movie, but I can guarantee you it will not be as bad as people actually seeing this film. And I imagine that they were looking at the dailies and, you know, everyone who's looking at them, of course, works for Mark Wahlberg because he's producing the movie. And they're like, wow, this is so bad. He's really doing a bad job in this movie. He's so miscast. This is a horrible character. It's unlikable, unsympathetic. I think someone should tell him. And then they go to someone, and the person next to them is like, well, you tell them. I'm not doing it. And then the person who originally brings up the idea goes, 
well, is this movie so horrible that I'm willing to lose my job over it potentially? Nope, just let it go and fail on its own. So I think that everybody, and every and everybody, by the way, not just in Hollywood, but everybody needs someone in their life who is brutally honest with them. Not in a way that embarrasses you, like in front of everyone, calling you out in front of everyone, but someone who pulls you aside privately and says, you know what, this is horrible. And I wish someone had done that for Mark Wahlberg, because this is truly a horrible, horrible movie. His character is self-destructive, suicidal, and in the most annoying way. At the end, Toward the end of the movie, I was like, why doesn't someone just kill this guy already? I had no idea why all these criminal underworld characters were giving him so many second breaks they're like oh well maybe he'll pay us back tomorrow and I'm like he will never pay you back I've been watching an entire movie I've only known this guy for this the course of the length of the movie and he's has no intention of paying anybody back you know I don't know why somebody just doesn't take a loss and shoot him for the good of the underworld community he was just so annoying uh, his character made no sense. He was a teacher, like the most offensive teacher ever. I'm not surprised that most of the people walked out of his class, but that was something the movie never really made clear. The movie made a lot of stuff incredibly unclear. Uh, I'm so disappointed that Rupert Wyatt is the director of this. This is why he didn't make Planet of the Apes, uh, the sequel to his Rise of the Planet of the Apes, why he didn't make Dawn. Uh, I know he said it was because uh, he didn't like the timetable for Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, but I, I think he should have found a way to make it work because uh, the film is attractive. It, like, it's, it's well shot. It's, it's a handsomely made film, but it's just so bad and makes no sense and they don't even ex explain to you how the gambling works you know the inside the mind of a gambler why does Mark Wahlberg sometimes win why does he sometimes lose is there any skill to it it seems like there's absolutely no skill he's just somewhat lucky uh, but really a horrible horrible movie and I think just a huge embarrassment to Mark Wahlberg uh, and at a time when I think he shouldn't he doesn't need any embarrassments. I mean, I thought he was good in Transformers. I, I liked him in Pain and Gain. I think he's good in Ted. I like Mark Wahlberg quite a bit. He has the Entourage movie coming up. I mean, he's at a really good point in his career. Why go and make a movie? You know, he doesn't have anything he needs to prove right now. Uh, I guess, you know, after, you know, he was very good in The Fighter even, another movie that he produced, but he was overlooked for the award season. But that was a movie that was, he was well cast in. But this is just, he is totally out of his depth in every conceivable way as an actor and as a producer uh, and as a filmmaker. Just, it's horrible. I mean, don't watch it. And if you do, just get it as a rental. Uh, and I'm telling you, you will be shocked that someone in Mark Wahlberg's current position would make a movie like this. All right, so those are my top 10 worst movies of 2014. I'm looking forward to discussing it with you further in the comments. Thank you so much for tuning in, and thank you everybody who encouraged me to make this episode. I hope you enjoyed the results. All right, thanks for watching. Bye.